Hello, everybody. An exciting day today in the markets. Thank you all for coming. For those of you who are here twice, thank you so much, especially to the mods, TND, Tesla, K8. This one is probably one of the most common questions I get. And again, I work for you all. And this one as well is... It's going to start out, it's kind of interesting because I've never been in such violent agreement with somebody before on so many topics from one of these I Got Challenge video series. But at the same time, at the end, it takes a violent twist to something that may be offensive to some. So if you are meek and gentle, you might want to leave this video now and not stick around to the end. But it is important that we go into everything with our eyes wide open. And as I always say, trust nobody. And that means nobody. Okay, so let's go. This will be the first ever quant analysis of the pros and cons of self-custody versus buying the Bitcoin ETF instead. And uh, we've got a very interesting composite score at the end. And then some interesting things. So as we go through this journey, I want you to put yourselves in the shoes of your own situation, in your own jurisdiction in your own, how much worth you have, etc., etc. It'll be interesting. And of course, not advice, any financial advice. And a shout out as well to Brian Murphy, new to Patreon, started watching the channel a few years back. I'm looking forward to James helping me to catch up for retirement. Well, we were able to help a lot of people so far. So hope we can continue doing well. So shout out to Saab14, who came up with this I Got Challenge series. For the newbie, moderate investor, Bitcoin ETFs are far superior versus traditional self-custody. The question is, is that true? Or are ETFs for some people? Cold storage for others. Let's jump in. We're going to break it down. It's... 42 slides. Bitcoin's at 68,200. And as we go through this, I want you to think, what happens? What happens if people like Samson Mao, whatever, is correct and Bitcoin goes to a million dollars this year? Or if many of the other targets, it goes to half a million and somebody has a few. Moto89, thanks for coming. It becomes a substantial asset. So we're going to look at all of the pros and cons related to what this asset could become as well. So first question from Saab. Jeff Hammer, thank you for coming. Uh, security and ease of use. ETF investors receive professional management and oversight from the ETF providers. This greatly decreases the risk around self-custody. I agree, but I'm going to talk about self-storage advantages, the top 10, and then the top 10 disadvantages. So I'm going to kind of challenge you here a little bit, but not too much. So first of all, we look at this uh, direct ownership, obviously with self-storage, you have control over your Bitcoin. You own the private keys, which means you have full control of the assets and nobody can confiscate them from you. And I'll talk about that towards the end as, to, as well. There are no management fees. And we'll talk, we'll break down fees and what fees can cost over a long period as well. We'll talk about privacy. Self-storage allows you for much more anonymity and privacy since you're not required to disclose your identity or go through regulated financial institutions. One of the reasons why Bitcoin came about because of the global financial crisis. Also, there's no counterparty risk. When you store your Bitcoin yourself, there's no third party that can take it from you. Yeah, you can lose it, but it's kind of safe. You also have full control. You can access your Bitcoin anytime. You can send it anywhere. And you don't have to rely on the traditional rails, the traditional financial system, the traditional hours that they work, etc. Also, there's no tracking errors. Self-storage eliminates the tracking errors that can occur with ETFs, such as ensuring the value of your holdings is always accurate. And we know games are played at Wall Street, so we won't go into that here. Also, no third-party involvement. You don't have to trust a third party with your Bitcoin. There's also no regulatory risk. You're not exposed to potential changes in regulations that could affect ETFs. Or maybe the government will come out with a new law saying, well, we're going to tax unrealized capital gains on Bitcoin or whatever. Who knows? You know, they are going to be looking for taxes. And educational is important, too. It's kind of like a learning experience, managing your own Bitcoin, which can help you understand the technology better and appreciate it better, too. And that's a very often overlooked advantage of it too. And then decentralization. Obviously, self-storage aligns with the decentralization ethos of Bitcoin, keeping control in the hands of kind of not your keys, not your coins, all the stuff you've heard before. 
they are the advantages. Let's look at some of the disadvantages because it is not trivial to store your own Bitcoin. So first of all, you do need technical know-how. If you do not have technical know-how, don't even try. <laughs> you're just going to screw something up and you're going to lose your coins, okay? We'll talk more about that as well in a minute. Uh, that risk of loss is always there. If your private keys are lost or stolen, you will lose your Bitcoin with no way to recover it. Also, security risks. Um, while a Bitcoin ETF is managed by professionals, self-storage requires you to protect your own Bitcoin, which can be a significant responsibility. And also, there's no insurance. You lose your keys. Hard luck, tough luck, whatever. Uh, there's no professional management. You've got no custody, custodies, etc. You are your own bank. There's no diversification as well. With self-storage, you're only investing in Bitcoin, whereas with ETFs, you can maybe move your exposure to a basket of different cryptocurrencies or assets in a retirement account, for example. Also, you've got limited accessibility of self-storage. Not everybody is comfortable with the technology required, and that could limit the accessibility of Bitcoin as an investment for many who want to do self-storage. Uh, what else we got here? Um, the potential for human error is probably the most important thing. One screw up on your toast. There's so many people that have lost their keys. There's so many people that have sent Bitcoin to the wrong address. There's so many people that have had a hardware wallet that just went kaput over time. Be careful and be aware of all of that. So one thing I do want to stress is lost coins. I made a video on this years ago. One of my early videos, I look much younger back then too. That's the old me. <laughs> this is the older me. Anyway, um, I did an analysis years ago, which I will update. But what I've been doing since 2017 is calculating all the wallets lost and, uh, and disappeared, whatever, into the ocean. And it's about 17.6% of the 21 million Bitcoin. Uh, the Satoshi lockup is about 5% additional lost, etc. Lo coins are being lost every single day. So basically, nearly four, nearly 5 million Bitcoin are gone. And they're never coming back. Okay? So just don't think it's not possible to lose your stuff. Even professionals with good IT capability lose their stuff all the time. All right, next issues. No issues with fiat on and off ramps. Some governments are limiting access to centralized exchanges, crypto exchanges, as soon as they see the word crypto. I do not see such issues for investing in ETFs. You're kind of sort of right in two ways. You know, you have a place like Vanguard, which will Vanguard you, prevent you from getting access to these ETFs. So that's not exactly true. And a lot of exchanges actually have no hassle with ETFs on-ramps, fiat on-ramps, off-ramps. So it kind of depends on where you are. Depends on your bank. Depends on the crypto exchange, etc. Keyframe, thank you so much. Um, and I do realize that there are some banks in different parts of the world. We've got members in the UK and Australia and etc. etc. And they have a real trouble of a time moving money uh, onto a crypto exchange. So it depends. We kind of half agree there. Now, Easier market access. ETFs are equivalent to stocks for most part. Yes, and there is certain familiarity with ETFs. Yes, and centralized cryptocurrency exchanges are complicated. And eh, not that complicated, but yeah, you're right. If you have been managing your own retirement account in, say, a Fidelity or a Schwab or something like that for years and years, you're very familiar. Opening up a Coinbase account or a Kraken or something else could be a headache for many. And then figuring out how to buy crypto and what to do with it then and all the different flavors yes it can be overwhelming i agree with you there but there's a couple of things that the etfs have advantages they do operate within regular and regulated financial markets the environment offers a level of security and trust that many crypto exchanges cannot offer or match and that gives a lot of people the assurance they need to be able to invest in crypto. That's why I was very excited about the ETFs, because it brings in a whole new audience that we've never had before. And money makes everything go up. So that's a good thing. So I agree with you there, too. Now, inheritance is made easy. This is a common, common issue. We have, we have many members as well that have, um, you know, they've got kids and 
sometimes the third generation that wants to be taken care of. And in case something happens in a diving accident or skydiving accident or whatever, so something we don't like to think about, but we are all going to die. Yes, it's uh, you delivered that message, so I didn't have to. ETFs will seamlessly be transferred over to the heirs once we die and no different to any other financial asset. And Bitcoin in cust self-custody is a lot more complicated. Firstly, trying to figure out if the person has any Bitcoin, where the seed phrase is, if he, her, ever trusted anyone to leave it in a will, or to any other person. Believe me, going back to the 5 million Bitcoin lost, a lot of it happened here. Um, so, sad to say. So, absolutely agree on this one. There are a lot of advantages, uh, ease of estate planning, the simplicity simply transferred to heirs, bingo there. Reducing the risk of loss, absolutely bingo there too, which is very important for many people. And uh, it's very, very complicated to figure out what to do with Bitcoin. If it does exist, where it is, can it even be recovered, etc. And then you also have legal clarity and protection as well under the laws, where you may not have that on a wallet or a key or a seed phrase or something else. So right on the money there. Now, simpler taxes, another good thing. Uh, this is jurisdiction specific, but clear tax law has not yet been adequately challenged in many jurisdictions around pure Bitcoin. Correct. It can be challenging to arrive at a correct cost of Bitcoin. Bingo. And the ETFs, it should be easier to calculate the profit and the cost of the ETF. And the fees towards the ETF are also tax deductible in a few jurisdictions, etc. So this is really good and very, very important taxes. Are critical we'll talk about fees too but taxes are so so important so we totally agree here simplified tax reporting potential tax deductibility of fees and clarity and tax treatment yes 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 again i did warn you a lot of agreement in this video tax strategy too you can invest into etfs as part of a pension plan in the usa this is a serious tax advantage rather than no benefits from a tax perspective of self-custody correct and uh, people should consider getting into the ETF early, especially if the price is going to go up a lot to avoid any big capital gains tax liability. Yes, 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 yes. Very important. But there's other things you can do too. Let me just add a couple. The tax deferred growth is a huge advantage. Massive. Also, what you can do too is you can really build your bags. And many people have done that here as well by trading between proxies you know you sell micro strategy was oversold you put it into an etf or you put it into a miner or something else and you flip back when the time is right you can really amplify your returns tax-free frictionless it's amazing also you've got your simplified compliance and reporting and strategic tax planning is all there part and parcel so yes 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 more violent agreement now there's a cool point as well that some people don't agree with but uh the number of ETFs across the US, it's possible for investors to split their ETFs across the number of providers to balance risk if they are so inclined. Yes, if people are f afraid of a, an ETF player stealing their Bitcoin or rehypothecating it or whatever else, a very good thing to be aware of. As I always say, spread it around. And you can also do that arbitrage with the proxies too. Not just the ETFs, but also things like MicroStrategy and miners. Uh, a lot of fun can be had playing those too. Now, uh, before we get into the juicy stuff, cost-benefit analysis. ETFs offer a transparent fee structure that is known in advance. And self-custody can be potentially variable and high cost if low amount of Bitcoin is invested. Very interesting there. Let's look at... Let's take some time to look at fee breakdown and what fees actually cost. So I'm going to pull in two examples. One is a 1.5% fee, which is the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust fee right now. And what actually 1.5% costs? So imagine you invested a million dollar cash into Bitcoin now for 10 years, and you get a 20% compound annual growth rate. Of course, it's one of my videos. I'm going to have tables in it. But by the way, 20% compound annual growth rate might sound ridiculous, but the historic growth rate for Bitcoin over the last 10 years is actually 40%. So I'm taking half of that, assuming some diminishing returns, but it could maintain 40% considering now it's an asset class unto itself. So what does this 1.5% cost you here? Again, uh, in the first year, again, as I say, don't sweat it for the first year. It's not, not a lot 
over the first year. It goes from, you know, with with the 1.5% fee, you got 1.185 versus $1.2 million. Over five years, it becomes a bit substantial. And over 10 years, definitely very substantial. So breaking this down, the impact of these 1.5% fees over a five-year period will cost you 151680 bucks, And over 10 years, $731,000. That is nearly a million bucks. And for a loved one, 10 years from now, that's a big piece of cheddar. So you do not want to be in a high fee ETF for a long period of time. A year, no problem. 15 grand and a million dollars is not a big thing. But it eats away at your bag and that affects the compound interest as well on the asset. Let's look at some of the current fees of the new ETFs. They are 0.25%. And here you can see it's less, but still does add up. Over one year, two and a half thousand versus 15,000. Over five years, it's 26,000. And over 10 years, about $128,000. So again, your bag goes with just a 0.25, 25 basis point fee. Um, your bag goes to 6 million versus 6.2 million. And with a 1.5% fee, your bag goes from 5.4 million to 6.2 million. That would be in the beautiful self-custody, no fees. So there's a reason the ETS want to be in this business, because it's very lucrative. They get to charge you fees and play with the spreads and all that good stuff too. So always take that into account. Now, regular, blah, blah, regulatory impact and investor protection. There is extra oversight with the ETFs. That's good. Also seen as a rubber stamp from the SEC and gives investors more confidence in the underlying asset. Yes. And this also feeds down to the financial advisors who are people who get people to invest, thus bringing more people into the scope of buying Bitcoin. Sort of yes, but I'll challenge you here is do we trust Wall Street? Do we trust the SEC? We found out that we can't. They are not. How do I say <laughs> without getting into trouble? Well, we just can't trust the SEC. And do we trust financial advisors, where many people call them glorified salespeople? They are paid to sell stuff. They're not going to take your portfolio account apart and allocate it correctly for maximum returns. No, they're just there to sell you stuff. That's how they make money. So bear that in mind as well when you think about these groups. Now, advanced financial strategies. There's a couple of cool things you can do. You can borrow. You can use the ETF as collateral. And you can borrow on margin to maybe buy some more of the ETF or more of something else as well. You can do margin trading and you can hedge. Very, very important as well. So my retort to this is yes, they do have a suite of advantages that you do not get with cold storage. Absolutely. Especially in the context of leveraging Bitcoin for broader financial activities. For example, if you have a big bag, you know, I envision one day Fidelity will let you borrow against your Bitcoin that could be at custody of Fidelity, and then you can buy a house with it. And as Bitcoin grows, you probably never have to repay that back at all. Also, these ETFs are marginable. They will be optionable, and therefore they will be hedgeable as well. And hedgeable is a word. <laughs> if it's not, I made it up, but you know what I mean. Hedging uh, things like a volatile asset like Bitcoin will be extremely important in the future as well. Especially when we look at a day like today when it was up $3,400 or $400 at one stage. A big day for Bitcoin. Big day. Now, conclusion. This is where it's going to get spicy. So I'm going to, I think for the first time ever, break it down and score it as I would with equal weightings and then talk about things we need to be aware of. So first of all, the top 10 risks of the Bitcoin ETF. We talked about the pros and cons of ETFs over self-custody, but this is the risks of the ETFs. Not your keys, not your coins. We've covered that. Uh, also, it does contribute to centralization. If everybody buys the ETFs, there is no decentralized Bitcoin. Coinbase will hold all the Bitcoin on behalf of the ETFs, and that's not a good situation to be in. We don't want that to happen. Also, there's custodial risks. They could lose stuff or be hacked or whatever else. Also, this is that decreased privacy, which I'll hammer home again, is very important. And there is the dilution of freedom money concept as well, which is kind of uh, an interesting angle. This, you know, Bitcoin was always celebrated as the freedom of money that can be sent anywhere in the world without permission. 
But if you hold it through an ETF, you can't do that. You have to trade it back to fiat before you can do anything with it. And that would be under the regulatory and institutional control. So you're kind of stuck there. So you lose a lot of that freedom. Also, there is historical precedence of asset seizure, for example, confiscation of gold by the U.S. government in 1933, and it's just a cautionary tale for the centralization of assets. You know, if you have, imagine back in 1933, you kept all your gold at a bank and the bank had to do what the government wanted. Boom. Nothing you could do. It's gone. Bye-bye. Same thing could happen with Bitcoin. Not saying it will, but we'll talk about that more in a second. Then, uh, what else? You've got limited control over your assets. So, for example, imagine Coinbase and BlackRock held all the Bitcoin and said, hey, you know what? We really, we got this terrible supply crunch on our hands and, and we need more Bitcoin. So we're going to fork it and create 42 million Bitcoin instead of 21. And then all our problems would be solved. If they hold your Bitcoin, you don't have any control, or voting rights, etc. over it. So that's very important. Again, just thinking out loud, again, not going to happen, but potentially. Uh, what else? If your accounts could be frozen, you know, if there's regulatory crackdown or you don't do something that the government wants or you refuse a certain thing that comes in a little thing, which I won't talk about. Uh, you know, it's happened before. Who knows if it'll happen again? And also having all the Bitcoin in a few minor, a few hands uh, really is a big problem. It is a huge problem for, you know, we know a place like BlackRock and the government work very close together. Imagine if some people were in control and they decided to do some crazy stuff. Thank you so much, Chaotic Coder. So they're the top 10 risks of these ETFs that I see, and there could be more. But the pros are also there too. And this is, uh, in German, you say Geschmackssache, which is like a taste thing. You know, it makes it much more accessible, much more convenient. You get the regulatory oversight. You got integration in traditional portfolios like retirement accounts. They're tax efficient. They're liquid. You got a far greater reduced risk of theft or even losing your Bitcoin. You can diversify. And you've got professional management and professional custody. And everybody is familiar with this stuff. But let's talk about the spicy stuff right now. One of the big issues uh, that has happened lately is sometimes governments overreach. Now, I'm not going to talk about who or what, but if you look at the UK government, sorry if anybody here is from the UK, I know there's a bunch of you in the chat, but there has been an increase in the amount of what I call seize and freeze of accounts. Um, and I don't even know what the data is for 2023, 2024. It's so, so new. But the point is, it's on the rise. So if anybody is a dissident in the country, sometimes politicians do the wrong thing, and that's bad. Or they might think, oh, maybe they're associated with somebody else that we don't like, or they promote something we don't like, or whatever else. It can get you into hot water, and a lot of very high net worth individuals in the UK lost their stuff. And that's kind of good because it's a wake-up call for what can happen. Then we had other governments. Hello, Canadians, if you're there. Hey, Clay Coffee. Uh, we had governments freezing, freezing accounts in a place called Canada, where you think was kind of the freest place in the world, but no, that happened there too. Anyhow, anything can happen. We need to be prepared. Enter Ark Invest. They have a kind of like in Bitcoin price prediction model for across a whole bunch of different things like ETF flows, etc. But one of the pieces that they've had in there for years, especially now with their $3.8 million target, is what they call seizure resistance. A big part of their price models because when everything goes to hell, you don't want to be exposed. If you're on the wrong side of the government and whatever regime it is and whatever part of the world you are, this is what ARK Invest, and I've always admired their work, hey, Doc Intern, but they place a big value on this because there are places in the world where governments can seize your assets. And I, I just covered two that are ones you wouldn't think would do it, like the UK and Canada. But this stuff happens. That's big. And there's more stuff, too, because we know the whole world is in a big debt spiral and the governments need to raise more money. Okay? Now, it's going to be like getting blood from a stone, but they're still probably going to try it. And we've seen governments do very irrational things over the past four years. 
things that I would never have imagined in my life, they did. Hopefully they'll never do it again, but there's always that little bit of risk that perhaps they could. So there's lots of talk for many years that, you know, governments could come after unrealized capital gains. They have a plan to tax the rich, go after millionaires, decamillionaires, billionaires, etc. Little do they know, these people have the wherewithal to leave and go away, and then they lose the tax base. So that, again, many things like this may never pass, but the point is, these are things that are considered by governments, and they need money. Okay, AI is going to ravage jobs, I think. I could be completely wrong. And it's going to reduce the tax base. So the governments are going to have to go after property owners and billionaires to get the money. Or it could be people with Bitcoin, because they don't like Bitcoin. So if you own Bitcoin, you've got to pay unrealized capital taxes on it unrealized capital gains taxes, and that could be a problem. And again, I'm just tinfoil adding here, thinking out loud. I did warn you it could be spicy, but that is a concern. Now, let's look at all the pros and cons. I weighed them up, equal weighting. You've got all the top tens. Do this exercise for yourself. Find out where you are in the world, your jurisdiction, and score what's important to you. So the overall scorecard here is, hey, Gabriel, you're up late. Thanks for coming. The winner is self-storage, but only a slight edge. So I calculated the positives and the negatives for self-storage versus Bitcoin ETFs. And the ETFs have a slight negative one. The self-storage has a slight positive one. Again, it's very slight, but it is very persona-based, jurisdiction-based, how much you have, etc. But there's more. Uh, a couple of things just to reiterate too. We think we can trust the governments, but sometimes there's a very fine line between communism and socialism. We're seeing things happen that are very, are considered, some people call it socialism, but some of the planks or goals of communism is to abolish property ownership, you know, and control things like rents, have a heavy progressive tax, abolish rights of inheritance, which we mentioned here, confiscate property of all emigrants and rebels rebels okay <laughs> if you drive in a truck in canada you could be considered a rebel just food for thought centralization of credit in the hands of the state the government becomes the bank we've heard a lot about central bank digital currencies and the power of jp morgan etc even other stuff that bubbled up this week with a big stablecoin issuer and their plans to work with the government again it's not a far stretch that five or ten years from now, point number five here could be in play. Also, centralization of the means of communication and transport in the hands of the state. We saw that already with the old Twitter. It's, again, this is from, what, 160, 170 years ago? But you can see it's not a big stretch to do your mental gymnastics to get over there. Now, <coughs> big part of this. Cold storage is risky, but the question is, it all boils down to probably one of the key factors for people is, do you trust your government, wherever that is? That is not, uh, hopefully that's not an American government building, I think it might be. Anyway, it could be anywhere in the world. Do you trust your government to treat you fairly? If no, self-custody is the thing for you. Final, final slide. I always say, have a go bag. So it might be okay to have part of your assets in an ETF, but a little bit in self-custody just in case things do go a little bit crazy out there in the world. So always have that go bag and in the future, fleeing a country may be necessary. And again, I'm not tinfoil hatting here. I'm repeating what people very close to me, not far from where I am with a lot of money are planning. Okay. So again, mental gymnastics are not difficult. I'm here to hopefully prepare you all as much as possible. I did warn you, be spicy. Thank you all for coming. Hope you like the show. I uh, hope I wasn't too, uh, hope I didn't scare people too much. But these are very, very important things you need to consider. So have that go bag ready. ETFs are great, have a lot of advantages. And Bitcoin is over $68,000, ladies and gentlemen. And it's probably going to go back to 69000 tonight. 
Thank you all for coming once again. And thank you to the mods in the chat. Thank you, Gabrielle. Thank you, Doc Intern. Thank you, Jeff Hammer. Thank you, Chaotic Coder. Thank you, TND Tesla. K8, Sean Donnelly. Sorry for keeping all the Europeans late. Big day, important topic. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.